Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you now and always. Amen. You may be seated. And let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you <clears throat> that you are so generous, that you are kind and abundant in your love and mercy. In fact, your mercies are new each morning. We thank and praise you that we see your blessings all around us. Lord, help us each day to faithfully use your blessings, those which you pour into our hearts and our lives. Help us to use them to glorify your holy name. This we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who is our risen Savior. Amen. I wonder how many of you know the name Kenneth Lay. Now, hopefully most of you do not recognize that name. Because if you do recognize that name, it probably means that you might have had some investments in the corporation Enron Energies which in 2001 filed for bankruptcy. Now this might sound a bit interesting because Enron Energies in two, the year 2000 posted 111 billion, with a B, profit. And the very next year, they filed for bankruptcy. Unfortunately, the year before, and several of the years before, they had been cooking the books, as they say. They had been falsifying numbers and reports. The the bankruptcy of Enron Energies was so significant that it was the largest in U.S. history to in, uh, up till 2001. In that bankruptcy, 20,000 people lost their jobs. Many of them lost their life savings. People lost billions and billions of dollars in investments. Banking firms went under. This was significant. Now, Kenneth Lay, what does he have to do with all this? He was CEO of Enron Corporation, almost consistently from 1985 to 2001. In 2004, he was indicted on federal charges, including wire fraud, securities fraud, uh, conspiracy, and mis intentionally misleading law enforcement. In 2006, he was convicted. What I find is interesting is when he was convicted, he, say, he said, we believe that God, in fact, is in control. And indeed, he does work all things for the good for those who love the Lord. By the way, he was the son of a Baptist preacher. Now, if you were to listen to his trial, and you probably still can find elements of it online, it does not sound like a man who loved the Lord, at least not more than money. He was $100 million in debt. He had recently bought his wife a $200,000 yacht. He showed a life of pretty negligent self-indulgence and greed. Now, when you hear of somebody like Kenneth Lay, it might be easy for us to be angry, frustrated. How can someone live that way? How can someone have such careless disregard for others? How can their avarice be so great that they don't think about the 20,000 employees who will be affected by their choices? On the other hand, though, this clashes with much of what society says. Much of society says, well, greed, well, restrained is a good thing. Think about it for a minute this way. How many corporations do we celebrate for making lots of money, and not just lots of money, but doing so maybe in ways that are not always the best and most legitimate ways, as long as they please their shareholders. Greed's not so bad, or at least in our society, it's become fairly ambiguous. Maybe in some cases it's good. Maybe in some cases it's bad. It all depends on do the ends justify the means? Will the ends turn out better for most people or not? Now, God's word, in contrast, though, it answers very directly that greed is neither ambiguous nor is it good by any stretch. In fact, if you all probably could say this with me as I read it, read Paul's advice to the young pastor Timothy as he pastored the church at Ephesus. He said, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. You've heard this verse read over and over. You've heard sermon after sermon on the love of money being the root of evil. Certainly in Mr. Lay's life, you recognize it right away. Or if you know the name Bernie Madoff, he operated the Ponzi scheme that defrauded 13,000 people. There we see the love of money and the danger it causes. But maybe, maybe it's only when it causes such great danger, such great damage. 
At least that seems to be the way the world thinks. Again, the Bible, though, answers that very thinking. Jesus in Mark chapter 7 says, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Where I'm going here is a lot of times we connect greed to someone who's wealthy. But the truth of the matter is, a wealthy person can be both greedy or can be generous. A person who barely has two pennies to rub between their fingers, they can be both greedy and they can be, or they can be generous. The root of greed, the root of this evil, is not so much in how much a person makes, but how they use that which God has provided them. Let me say that again. The root of greed is not how much a person makes, but it is how they use that which God provided them. And it's important we remember that. Because when we think of greed, we realize that it is not about the paycheck and it is not about the dollar bills that you have in your bank account. But it becomes about how you use God, what God has given you. And let's go back to our gospel reading for this morning. Because I think in our gospel reading, Jesus illustrates this so well as he often does. In our gospel reading for this morning, we have this man who comes and he says, Lord, my brother and I, we can't get along. We can't separate our inheritance. So I embellished it a little, but that's basically the gist of it. And Jesus so wisely answers him with a parable. The main character of this parable is a man who has done well for himself. It's a man who has been blessed, blessed abundantly by God. Ways beyond compare. So much so that he has to tear down his barns and build new ones. He has money to do so and still fill his barns. And so he's feeling pretty good about himself, isn't he? He sits back. He sips his Mai Tai by the pool, pats himself on the back and says, well, now I can relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Probably minus the Mai Tai and the pool, but still, you get the point. It's interesting because the word relax there is actually the word to cease from doing anything, to cease from movement. So we see not only greed, but slothfulness as well. Now Jesus answers this attitude. He says of this man, Fool. Now, that's not the same word that he uses in Matthew 5 when he says, don't call your brother Raka or fool. But this is a word that means this guy was out of his mind. Quite literally is, what, is how that translates. This guy is out of his mind because he thinks that he can hold on to this wealth. He thinks that he's set for life. As we see from, from, the, from the text, as we look at it, we see that Jesus was pointing out that the priorities were all wrong. This man was so worried about what was temporal, what was short-lived, that he had lost focus on what was eternal, what would last forever. I love how Job answers this. He says in Job chapter 1, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How true it is. Naked we come into this world, naked we shall leave this world. How true it is we can't take it with us. We can't even take the clothes on our back with us. But notice what the sin of this man was. That he was not rich toward God. Very last phrase of the text. Important we don't skip over those phrases because they usually mean something. Okay, always mean something. He was not rich towards God. We actually maybe don't use this language today, but we see this oftentimes in our world today. Have you talked to someone who calls themselves a self-made man or a self-made woman? A person who we celebrate in our country, who have pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, who has come from a place that was uh, poor, a place where they had to really work hard all their life, and we celebrate that. And these people, they have worked hard. We certainly should not discount that. But notice how a lot of those self-made folks talk. They talk about their success, my success. Who needs God when I can supply all my needs? Who needs God when I can provide for what I need? And this is the danger. This is the danger when you have a great amount of money. That danger of looking at your life and seeing only your success and missing what God has done. 
missing that all that he has provided for you, the ability to pay cash for a car, to pay all your bills and pay off your house. Those are only gifts from God. But greed, it poisons us and has us look inside. Oh, it is what I have done. Look at me. Greed leads to pride, centering us as the God of our lives. But the problem with greed is it doesn't just poison the hearts of the wealthy, which sometimes sometimes you think that's the case, that you hear out in the news or things like that, that wealth must be a bad thing. But that's not the case with greed. It actually poisons those who have a lot of money, those who are middle class, and those who have very little money. Now, you all are good Christian people, but greed has a tendency to also affect us. And it doesn't do so in the same way as it might who ha- affect someone who has a lot of money. But greed, it, it, it gets at us in other ways. Let me back up just a minute. Think about it this way. When you are doing well, able to pay your bills, put food on your table, make your house payment, make your car payment, it's easy to be generous, isn't it? It's not too hard to write that check to God, to, to the church. It's not too hard to, to offer a few extra bucks to someone who's on the corner, even if you don't know what they're going to do with it. Now, how does our attitude change, though? When things are a bit tighter. Or not just when things are a bit tighter. When things aren't going our way. What about when God doesn't seem to be in our camp? When he doesn't seem to be doing what we want him to do? When he all of a sudden is, or the promotion we got is not all that we thought it would be. That our family is not uh, the, all that we expected. And the, the fights continue on. That our golden years are a bit more tarnished than we care for them to be. And things aren't going the way we want them to. So many people, when that happens, they blame God. And generosity, when people start blaming God, it dries up. When people start turning on God and saying, what have you done for me lately? Okay, none of us would ever say that out loud. But how many of us in our hearts sometimes question what God is truly doing? If we're honest. And we're not nearly as generous, are we? To the person on the curb. We're not nearly as generous to those in need. We may find it harder to support ministries when it feels like, well, God's not doing what we want him to do. Notice greed poisons people in the same way, whether you have a lot of money or a little. Because who takes the place of God in your life, whether you have a lot of money or a little? If If it's greed, it'll be me. It'll be what I want, what is best for me. The the wealthy person, my successes, what I have done for myself. When we struggle, what has God done for me lately? Don't I deserve a little more? And Jesus answers this attitude. He answers the attitude of greed in such a way that, one, a way that is so familiar to us, but a way that we need to hear over and over again. Fear not. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell off your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is from Luke 12, right after our text for today. Jesus says, don't let worries consume you. Don't let the things of this world be all that controls you. Just like gluttony is about self-indulgence, about all the things of, that bring us pleasure in this world. Well, greed in the same way focuses us on materialism, on things that will also pass away, that r- rust will destroy, that moth will destroy, that thieves will steal. Jesus says instead, place your heart where it will be filled up with all the good things of God. In fact, he says the money bag rather. The money bag, let it be filled by God instead. Let the richness of God dwell in your hearts and your life. Let the richness of God fill you because you know, you know this because if any of you have ever had money, had a lot of money, you know that it doesn't bring happiness. There's that that false truth in the world that that you can buy just about anything, but you can't buy happiness, can you? You can never buy happiness. And we know that to be the case. You can buy a lot of things. Think of the game Monopoly. I don't know if any of you like to play that game. But the main goal of that game is to beat everyone else, isn't it? 
to have the most money, to have the most property. But if we play life that way, in the end, we end up with an empty heart. As empty as it is after that game. Only the love of God fills our hearts and our lives. Only recognizing that out of His great love for us, He provides for all that we need in this life. Out of His great love for us, He has provided for us the greatest need in this life. Eternal life through His Son and the forgiveness of our sins. He has placed us first, even when we have not placed Him first. He has placed us first, and He was willing to spend everything, not silver and gold, but His precious blood, so that your life might be with Him forever. And the beautiful thing about this gift, the beautiful thing about this gift is that it is a gift that is meant to be shared. It is meant to be given away. John, he seems to do such a nice job in our epistle reading for this morning. He summarizes it so well. By this we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Jesus himself demonstrated his great love for us, not in word and talk, but in living out his love for us by dying on the cross, by rising again and giving us the promise of eternity. Greed is destroyed in our hearts and our lives when we recognize the gifts of God. Greed is destroyed in our hearts and lives when we live out our, our faith, when we live out our, his, God's love for us. And the beautiful thing about that generosity, living, recognizing God's generosity and sharing it with others, it's the way that God blesses it. Now, don't worry. We're not going to have a, uh, one of those sermons where all of a sudden I'm going to tell you that if you bless others, that all of a sudden you're going to have all kinds of money or something like that. That's the prosperity gospel. But what I will tell you is God's promise from Scripture. He does promise that He will bless us when we are a blessing to others. He doesn't say that it will always be monetary. He doesn't always say that it will be that we have exactly what we believe we need or what we believe we want. But He does say that He will bless us Maybe it will be with filling our hearts with great love. Maybe it will be with that full assurance that we have more than we need for this life. However it will be, He makes us that promise that not only will He fill us up, but He will press it down, shake it together, and keep filling it till it is running over. And that is how God gives, us, gives to us with His grace and with His generosity even more than we can imagine. So dear people, in God, dear people of God, May you be poor in this world, but rich in God's grace. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for the many gifts that you have given us in this life. We thank you, O Lord, for the way that you have blessed us, that we might use these gifts to help and bless others. Lord, at times we know that we misuse these gifts. At times we, we grow miserly. At times we grow, we've only focused on our success. Forgive us for those times and help us instead to see the great generosity which you have shown to us, the way that you have shown us love. May we not only receive that love, but reflect that love to others. Lord, we do thank you for the gifts we have, for we know they are gifts from you as we use those gifts. Lord, may we always have an attitude of thankfulness in our hearts, knowing your great grace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.